are these people? I've got a big story. And again, a lot of people have already started, have talked about this or heard about this. We're going to read the whole damn thing because that's what we do here. We read the articles and that's something that I actually am proud of. Other people, not so much, but I'm proud of the fact that we actually read the whole thing and let you guys figure it out for yourselves while we're breaking it down. Not on Rumble. Well, looks like we got ourselves a reader. God damn it. All right. I'll have to rerun it there later. <laughs> Whitney but wrote in Whitney Webb, for those who don't know, Unlimited Hangout Indie Media Award honoree. She's a, you know, inaugural class, first ballot Hall of Famers type of thing. For those who don't know, learn, learn something, follow, subscribe, support, follow her on Twitter. You will be blown away quickly. And then watch her do an interview and watch her recall in an interview. And you're just like, oh, my God, how, how? she's a name. She's a name dropper constantly, but she also connects the dots. Well, this one worked for this and they did this. So you got to figure that they did this. And wow. She gives you the lowdown and the breakdown on what's going on with J.D. Vance, who is Trump's VP pick. Now, mm. I don't know how many of you know who Peter Thiel is. I don't know how many of you know who Palantir is. I don't know. You know, we're going we're gonna to get into all that. But what she says is that while J.D. Vance has his own controversies, his close connection to billionaire Peter Thiel, who is poised to have unprecedented influence in a new Trump administration, should deeply unsettle every American who cares about freedom, privacy, and reigning in the surveillance state. And that certainly, I think, applies to all of us here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, Whitney Webb. That's right. That's right, V.S. Adams. Whitney Webb. Um, Jimmy Dore headline, unions are switching to Trump. Oh, my God. Okay. She was like that. She was in that new Spider-Man movie, right? Whitney? Madam Webb. She... Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Okay. After the recent revelation <laughs> that Donald Trump has selected J.D. Vance as his VP uh, nominee... Public attention not only turned toward Vance, but toward the billionaire Peter Thiel. Why? Vance has been one of several prominent Thiel protégés whose profile has risen in recent years, with other protégés of the PayPal co-founder, including OpenAI's Sam Altman and Anderil's Palmer Lucky. Recent reports have also noted that Thiel first recruited Vance in his, into his circle while Vance was still a student at Yale Law School, ding, 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 red flags. Shortly thereafter, Vance joined Thiel's investment firm, Mithril Capital, where he worked for two years before Mithril. joining before joining Revolution Ventures. Vance played a major role. He just role. went straight to Runic Capital. God. Oh. No, they, oh. Right. So Vance played a major role in Revolution's Rise of the Rest seed fund, whose major investors included Amazon's Jeff Bezos and the Walton family of oh, Walmart, of who boast long-standing deep ties to the Clinton family. Vance later launched his own venture capital firm, Naria Capital, in 2020, which was heavily funded by Thiel, as well as former Google CEO Eric Schmidt, also not a good guy and heavily involved in the surveillance state. Yeah. Schmidt, a major Democrat donor, has been the guiding hand behind the Biden administration's science and technology policy and has dominated the, de the development of the AI policies of the U.S. military and intelligence communities, largely through his leadership of the National Security Commission on AI. That's a little scary. NSCAI promoted policies like the end of private car ownership and in-person shopping in the United States to advance Americans' adoption of AI as supposed national security imperative in the lead-up to the COVID-era lockdowns. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Both Schmidt and Thiel are key members of the steering committee of the controversial closed-door and overtly globalist Bilderberg Conference. Nothing to see here, folks. Yep. Newsweek, Newsweek once called Schmidt and Thiel the two most influentials at, influential figures at Bilderberg. Uh, it's not a place you want to get accolades like that at. Well, it's saying uh, something because it's literally place. the most powerful of the most powerful. Teal has voted. Men. I'm sorry. Teal has donated heavily to Vance's political Just career. Men. 
Uh-huh. He's given $15 million to Vance's successful Senate bid in the 2022 election cycle in what was then the largest donation ever given to one Senate candidate. No problem. Okay. Thiel also joined Vance, a former Never Trumper, to visit Trump's Mar-a-Lago, where Vance successfully won the former president's blessing. Thiel also <laughs> connected Vance to other members of the so-called PayPal mafia, like David Sachs, who donated a million to Vance, yeah. and hosted a fundraiser mm -hmm. for him. Sachs, along with PayPal co-funder Fuck You Elmo Muskhead, um, were allegedly a key factor in Trump's selection of Vance as vice president as they ran a secret lobbying campaign for Vance that included media presenter Tucker Carlson. What a surprise! Oh, tuck, tuck. Mm -hmm. Nice. Oh, a little Tuck Tuck. Teal had been a major donor to Trump's 2016 presidential campaign and served on the transition team with other Teal Link figures like Trey Stevens dramatically influencing Trump's Pentagon appointments. Nothing to see here. Mm. Stevens' influence at the Trump Pentagon also helped develop the military's relationship with the Teal funded company Anderil, which was co founded by Stevens and Teal, co Teal fellow Palmer Lockie. A little incestuous here. Are you seeing a pattern? Like Be Game of Thrones. Before Anderil, Lockie developed the virtual reality system Oculus Rift, which was later sold to Facebook where Teal then yeah, served yeah. on the board. Yeah, meta. Woo, meta. And, and Darrell is now building a virtual border wall for the federal government and Trump, who long campaigned on building the, a physical barrier. Is Mexico going to pay for it? Of course. Is Mexico going to pay for it? Of course. Please, please let them do that. Please let them do that in the metaverse. I'd be, that'd be hilarious. Yes, Mexico is going to build a fucking wall. Mexico is going to pay for the border wall in the metaverse. Uh huh. So, what, a f what a fucking we, cartoon we, bullshit. We, we live in a clown show, folks. Um, so, <laughs> of course, uh, yeah. He abandoned that promise during his first term, but now supports the exact solution that Andorilla is selling. Huh. Nah. Mm, funny how that works. Andoril's unmanned drones have come to play a major role in the Ukrainian military operations during the Russia-Ukraine conflict, as have other controversial Teal-funded companies like Palantir, which is a CIA contractor, and Clearview AI, which used mainly photos posted on Facebook and another Teal-backed company to develop its Orwellian facial recognition, facial recognition database. These companies... Close ties to the Ukrainian military, nothing to see here, may impact the second Not, Trump administration. There's anything wrong with that. Yes, there is. May impact the Trump second Trump administration's <laughs> policies as it relates to American support for Ukraine, particularly if Teal is slated to hold significant influence. Beyond Ukraine, this network of Teal-funded defense companies are, the, are remaking the face of warfare and slowly but surely replacing the human decision-making with AI. Because we know AI is so great go, at decision making. Go go check out how they test these things in Israel with lavender AI. That's going to be on our INN news. What what could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Uh, it'll be fine. <sighs> Boy, that escalated quickly. Yeah. While these ties should be unsettling on their own. The potential influence of Teal on the upcoming Trump administration should concern every American, and it, do, and it does me at least, regardless of where they fall uh -huh. on the political spectrum, due to Teal's efforts to rehabilitate and remake some of the intelligence community's most Orwellian and unconstitutional efforts to target domestic dissent. Are you listening, everyone? Domestic dissent. Hello? Ah. Oh. While Peter Thiel has long marketed himself as a libertarian, his track record from PayPal has revealed him, uh, from PayPal on, has revealed him to instead be an architect of the modern surveillance state and a successor to the neoconservative cabal that once tried but failed to do the same. During I can count on one hand, like, self-labeled libertarians that are actually decent. And they're all at like one publication. Yep. So, anti war. 
anti war. <laughs> right, right. Right. All right. Like, sorry, sorry, libertarians. But well, Pat, Patrick McFarland's all right. Um, he's pretty connected to them too, I think. He's all right. There's a yeah. few more. But yes, I agree. During PayPal's earliest days, Teal and his colleagues went around to various government agencies, including in intel agencies, to see how they could best tailor their product to win government support and contracts for their products and services. After leaving PayPal, Teal would follow a similar path in creating another company, Palantir. Palantir is the engine on which the surveillance state runs, and soon after Vance was announced as Trump's vice president, it was reported that Palantir co-founder Joe Lonsdale as well as Palantir itself, were backing a Trump-Vance super PAC called America PAC. Yep. Okay, that's a problem. A private company that, contra America. that contracts directly with the federal government, military, and intelligence agencies, backing a presidential candidate with a multi-million dollar PAC. No problem? Yep. Nope. It's perfectly fine. Unlimited Hangout has reported extensively on Teal and Palantir for several years. As noted in past reports, the company was created to be the privatized version of a post-9-11 surveillance program that had been dreamt up by the Iran-Contra criminals most responsible for the unconstitutional main core database. Uh, they talked about this on Jimmy Dore yesterday. During the Reagan administration... The individuals at the heart of the Iran-Contra uh, scandal, I believe it was John Poindexter, developed a database called Main Core, which firmly placed the U.S. national security state on its current tech-fueled path for crushing dissent. A senior government official with high-ranking security clearance and service in five presidential administrations told Radar in 2008 that Main Core was a database of Americans who, often for the slightest and most trivial reason, are considered unfriendly and who in a time of panic might be incarcerated. The database can identify and locate perceived enemies of the state almost instantaneously. Nothing to see here. Main core was express was expressly developed for use in continuity of government protocols by the key Iran Contra figure, Oliver North. We remember him and his allies that operated on an off-the-books intelligence apparatus with direct CIA involvement known as the Enterprise. I believe Poppy okay. Bush might Poppy Bush might have also been involved in that, but allegedly. Engage. Not that enterprise. And bro, it's the enterprise. It could only be that enterprise. It could it's clearly. Patrick Stewart is involved. Holly and his oh no, right. definitely well, no, it's military. It's US military. So definitely not Patrick Stewart. He's he's British. Bro, they bro the, the Enterprise had like proton torpedoes and nonsense. Like Yes, but they were also this, a one world government know. type of uh, organization. Yeah. But anyway. Oliver North and his also associates a US aircraft carrier, but continue. North and his associates used that continuity of government in Maine Corps to compile a list of U.S. dissidents and potential troublemakers, troublemakers to be dealt with if the continuity of government protocol was ever invoked. Oh, why would Oliver North ever be in looking into the invocation of continuity of government with Ronald Reagan as president, a senile, demented old man uh -huh. at the time? Huh. And they're doing hostage, oh. they're doing arms yeah. for hostages with Iran and Nicaragua and getting involved in I don't know. Probably hey, I, we we don't we don't capitulate with terrorists Indy clearly. Right. Um troublingly uh, uh these protocols could be invoked for a variety of reasons, including widespread panic, non nonviolent opposition to US military intervention abroad, that would be us widespread internal dissent, or a vaguely defined moment of national crisis or time of panic. Something like COVID or 9-11 or January 6th, for example. Oh, nah, maybe not, but maybe. North would later brush <laughs> up against the Trump administration, joining former Blackwater founder Eric Prince, 
in an effort to lobby the administration to create an off-the-books private CIA. And now Eric Prince is trying to lobby to be the head of the Secret Service or the head of the military or the head of the CIA or something under Trump, potentially. Mm. That's a little frightening. He's about as scary as it gets. That's Betsy DeVos's brother, by the way. Oh, okay. Fun. Main so core. Big club and all that. Oh, yes. Very big. Main core utilized the Promis software, which was stolen from its owners at Inslaw Inc. by top Reagan and U.S. intelligence officials, as well as Israeli spy master Rafi Eitan. Uh, oh. Also in intimately yes. involved in the Promis scandal, also intimately involved, was media baron and Israel's super spy Robert Maxwell. You've heard of him. Do, 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 do. Sorry. No, no, not that Continue. guy. The, the father of Ghislaine <laughs> and reportedly the man who brought Jeffrey Epstein to the Israeli intelligence orbit. Huh. Like sure. Promise, like Promise, main core involved both U.S. and Israeli there's, intelligence. There's never been... Indy, there's... Uh, you would have to have something like photo evidence of like someone like Trump or Elon Musk or... Uh, you know, meeting with Epstein in some way, Kamala Harris and Ghislaine, and nah. that doesn't exist, right? That couldn't possibly be a thing. No. Um, um, Clintons. Yep. Like Probus. You know, main, paintings main, of blue dresses. Uh, anyway, continue. Right. Main core involved both U.S. and Israeli intelligence and was a big data approach to the surveillance of perceived domestic dissidents. Now, it's really funny because I remember I've been listening to Whitney Webb now for about four years that I can remember. And mm. in a pro and I can remember very clearly in November of 2020, she talked about that, that the intelligence state was looking to potentially apply everything that they had learned overseas and turn a domestic operation either on by the Biden administration starting, you know, and she predicted something was going to happen on, you know, when it came to certifying the vote and that they were going to have some kind of a something and look what ended up happening. And then that they would use that as an excuse to ramp up the surveillance and security state. Huh. Did that happen? I, well, someone, I, 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 saw, I saw a quote today that was like, uh, fascism is when a colonialist power does colonials power things to itself. Huh? You know? As opposed to everywhere else. No. So, uh, you know, like, it so sounds about right. You know. I forget who made the quote. Someone will tell me. Sure. The Iran-Contra and mm. Promis scandals were exposed, but were subsequently covered up. Why? Largely by the then U.S. Attorney General William Barr, we've heard of him, who would return to serve in that same position during the Trump administration. That was during the Bush administration, the first one. The use of Maine Corps mm. by the federal government persisted and continued to amass data. That data could not be fully tapped into and utilized by the intel community until after the events of September 11, 2001, which offered a golden opportunity for the use of such tools against the domestic U.S. population, all under the guise of, of combating terrorism. For example, Nine, in the... 11. Very much so. For example, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, government officials reportedly saw Maine Corps being accessed by White House computers. Huh? <laughs> September 11th was also used as an excuse to remove information firewalls within the national security state, expanding information sharing amongst agency databases and, by extension, also expanding the amount of data that could be accessed and analyzed by Main core and its analogs. Huh. How about that? Mm. As, how about Alan, it? as Alan Wade, then serving as CIA's chief information officer, pointed out soon after 9-11, quote, one of the post-September 11th themes is collaboration and information sharing. We're looking at tools that facilitate communication in ways that we don't have today. 
9-11 was bad. Yes. Yes, it was. Just ask is this, the I feel like... I, go ahead. Ask the Israelis, I would say. Yes. I was going to say, I feel like I, I smell crowd strike coming up in this story, but, you know... There very well uh, might be, but I think that was another article. In an attempt sure. to build... I mean, on, it's very similar to all this, right? Sort of. In um, an attempt to build... Everything's connected. On these two post-9-11 objectives simultaneously, the U.S. national security state attempted to create a public-private surveillance program. Where have we heard those words before? So invasive uh -huh. that Congress defunded it just months after its creation due to concerns that it would completely eliminate the right to privacy in the U.S. No big deal. Called Total Information Awareness, and again, Whitney talked about this with Jimmy Dore yesterday, TIA, the program sought to develop an all-seeing surveillance apparatus managed by DARPA. TIA supporters argued that invasive surveillance of the entire U.S. population was necessary to prevent terrorist attacks, bioterrorism attacks, and even naturally occurring disease outbreaks, such as pandemics, huh, before they could take place. Um, I think That's you... Also the same organization that makes the robots and the drone swarms and... I, I was gonna say yeah. that I was gonna say that that's like the Morgan Freeman in Batman in the basement of the Batman movie, where he's literally got yeah. access to the map and grid of the entire city and who and where yeah. every and single like, person is. I never want to see this again. Yes, and he's like, "This well, is never too much." Never let me look at this again. This is too much power for anyone. So Morgan Freeman, Morgan Freeman, our friend Andy Dufresne. Uh, that's right, Andy uh, Dufresne. Andy Dufresne. <laughs> we have to have some fun because huh? this is just the most freaking dystopian shit you can imagine. All right. <laughs> of course, TIA uh, supporters, like we said, pandemics, we have to be able to prevent pandemics before they could take place. Pre-crime. The event the architect, the architect of TIA and the man who led it during its relatively brief existence again was John Poindexter. Remember, I mentioned that name before. Best known for being Reagan's. Fucking Poindexter. He was okay, yeah, he was good. yes, Poindexter I, was national with the fucking pocket yes. protector and shit and the suspenders. Yes. Bow tie. Yes. Uh, national security advisor during Iran Contra and being convicted of five felonies in relation to that scandal. He also yeah. fell on the sword pretty hard. But he was one of the architects. Poindexter during the Iran Contra hearings had famously claimed that it was his duty to withhold information from Congress. Which Did I do that? They were no, but I mean, <laughs> they are they're charged with oversight, and it was his duty to withhold. Mm -hmm. That's what he saw it as. In regard to total information awareness, one of Poindexter's key key allies was Chief Information Officer of the CIA, Alan Wade. Wade met with Poindexter in relation to TIA numerous times. And managed the participation of not just the CIA, but all U.S. intelligence agencies that had signed on to add their data as nodes to TIA and, in exchange, mm. gained access to its tools. So you give us your data and we'll let you access all this shit. Wade, while yeah. at CIA, had previously partnered with Robert Maxwell's daughter, Christine. Wait, 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 wait. I just fucking noticed... The fucking logo yep. is literally the fucking yes, Illuminati like, all seeing eye. eye. Yes. Jesus Christ. What yes. the f what? But worse. Jesus Christ. Okay, continue. Yep. <laughs> what the fuck? Oh, it gets worse. Uh, it only gets worse. I'm right? sure it does. Uh, yeah. Wade partnered with Robert Maxwell's daughter, Christine, on national security software called Chiliad, I swear to God, Chiliad, which had similarities to TIA as well as Palantir, but fell short of the proposed program's scope and ambition. Christine had previously been involved in her father's efforts to market bugged Proma software to U.S. national laboratories. I don't, uh -huh. know, how, I don't know how she got that, but there's an article from archive.org Oh, that's from One Nation Under Blackmail. That's that's a cite a citation from her book. 
That's again, Whitney Webb unlimited hangout for those who don't know and who are, who came in late. This is an article all about JD Vance and his connections to Peter Thiel and why that's bad and how it's, you know, and how it's badly going to influence the Trump administration's um, policies on surveillance and on military and on purchases and on where they're going to spend the money. The TIA program, despite the best efforts of Poindexter and his allies, such as Wade, was eventually forced to shut down after considerable criticism and public outrage. However, though the Pope, the program was defunded, it later emerged the TIA was never actually shut down with its various programs having been covertly divided among the web of military and intelligence agencies that make up the U.S. national security state. While some of those TIA programs went underground, the core Panopticon software the TIA had hoped to wield began to be developed by the company now known as Palantir, with considerable mm -hmm. help from the CIA and Alan Wade, their CIO, as well as John Poindexter. This is a real dangerous witch's brew. And as Sarah yeah, says... I mean, especially when it's called the Panopticon. And Palantir. Like, that sounds like a Thunderdome. Like, you can't, <laughs> you know... Anna Mayer's oh, Poindexter is a that. goddamn verb. No real humans are allowed to have a name that's morphed <laughs> into a verb. Right? Yeah, I know, dude. You can't. That's I know change we, your name, bro. We, we do not need a Chili's Baby Back Ribs soundtrack, for, sound drop for that. Sorry, yeah. sorry, Jamie. No, no. I was going to mention you were talking about Chili Ad or whatever. Yes. I and think my my gamer friends in the chat. Is that the Iliad? Tell you, I think that's that's the mountain in GTA Five, where there's a whole like cult. Uh, like alien UFO cult mission on it. No, it's like literally the chili ad cult alien area 51 nonsense. I don't know if that's pre crime going on there, but you know, uh, whatever. So, um, it was never shut down. All right. It developed software with help from, CIA, Wade, Poindexter, Palantir, all working together. Public-private partnership controlled by Peter Thiel. Guess what? Palantir is now a publicly traded company on the stock exchange. But that's all. We'll get there. Okay. At the time it was formally launched in February 2003, the TIA program was immediately controversial, leading it to change its name in May, three months later, to Terrorism Information Awareness instead of Total Information Awareness, <laughs> in an apparent attempt Terror. to sound less like an all-encompassing surveillance domestic surveillance system and more like a tool specifically aimed at terrorists. Terrorists! The TIA program was shuttered by the end of 2003. Um, and you're not going to get your baby back, baby back, baby back ribs, Jamie. Sorry. Not here. The same month <laughs> as the... C if, if in this article, you don't want baby back ribs in this article. No, definitely mean... not. Some things in there you don't want. Um, the same month, you know, as it might include it might include uh, ingredients such as Robert Rothschild's Moroccan carrot spread. Bro, you but still I, have you that know, shit. Of course, I still have that shit. I'm not going to throw it out. You're going to eat the rich? Like, is that what it is? <laughs> no, I'm yeah, not going to eat it at all. That should be their slogan: <laughs> "Eat the rich." Right? Oh God. The same month as the TIA... the dollar store, bro? <laughs> it's so funny. Rothschilds have gone anyway. way, 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 way down, down market. Way down, I know, I know. The same yeah. month as the TIA name uh, change, uh, Peter Thiel incorporated Palantir. Thiel, however, had begun creating the software behind Palantir months in advance, though he claims he can't recall exactly when. Huh. Some reports state that Palantir began as an anti-fraud algorithm at Thiel's PayPal. Thiel, Carp, and other Palantir co-founders claimed for years that the company had been founded in 2004, despite the paperwork of Palantir's incorporation by Thiel directly contradicting this claim. Also in 2003, 
Apparently soon after the Teal, after Teal formally created Palantir, Iraq war, war architect and Bush era neocon Richard Pearl called Poindexter saying that he wanted to introduce the architect of TIA to two Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, Peter Thiel and Alex Karp. According to a report in New York Magazine, Poindexter was, quote, precisely the person whom Thiel and Karp wanted to meet, mainly because, quote, their new company was similar in ambition to what Poindexter had tried to create at the Pentagon, that is, TIA. During that meeting, Thiel and Karp sought to pick the brain of the man now widely viewed as the godfather of modern surveillance, shaping Palantir into a TIA equivalent. Sure. Soon after, Pal Soon after Palantir's incorporation, though the exact timing and details of the investment remain hidden from the public, CIA's InQtel became the company's first backer aside from Thiel himself, giving it an estimated $2 million. InQtel's stake in Palantir would not be publicly reported until mid-2006. I wonder why. Alex Karp recently told the New York Times that the real value of the InQtel investment was that it gave Palantir access to the CIA analysts who were its intended clients. A key figure in the making of InQtel investments during this period, including Palantir, was CIA's chief information officer at the time, Alan Wade. God, that name keeps coming yeah. up. After the InQtel investment, the CIA held the unique position of being Palantir's only client until 2008. Mm. During that period... Palantir's two top engineers, Aki Jain and Stephen Cohen, traveled to CIA headquarters at Langley every two weeks. Nothing to see here. Jain recalls making at least 200 trips to CIA headquarters between 2005 and 2009. During these regular visits, CIA analysts would test Palantir software out and then offer feedback, and then Cohen and Jain would fly back to California to tweak it. As with InQtel's decision to invest in Palantir, the CIA's chief information officer at the time, Alan Wade, remember that name again, Alan Wade, she keeps saying it for a reason, played a key role mm. in many of these meetings and subsequently in the tweaking of Palantir's products. It should come as no surprise then that there is an overlap between Palantir's products and the vision that Wade and Poindexter had held for the failed TIA program. Because he's the link. The extensive overlap between the two is detailed in previously on un, previous unlimited hangout investigations about Palantir's Tiberius race and the public health panopticon is the article. And you see that that was from February. The benefits in repurposing the public private TIA into a completely private entity after TIA was publicly dismantled are obvious. For instance, Given that Palantir is a private company as opposed to a government program, the way its software is used by its government and corporate clients benefits from plausible deniability and frees Palantir and its software from constraints that would be present if it had remained a public project. Yeah. You know, proprietary so source code and shit versus it being public and owned by, uh, by everyone. Mm. Right? Here's a 2020 New York Times profile on Palantir, which noted that the data, which is stored in various cloud services or on clients' premises, is controlled by the customer, and Palantir says it does not police the use of its products. Uh huh. Nor are uh -huh. the privacy controls fool foolproof. It is up to the customers to decide who gets to see what and how vigilant they wish to be. How convenient. And I'll bet there's no back door for him to look at any of this stuff, right? I mean, it definitely doesn't. They've never provided something like, I don't know, an entire cloud service through a video platform that people could put their files and data into. But, you know. Yeah, maybe. Host servers on. Well, not long after... Thing. 
Not long after Teal helped resurrect TIA as Palantir, another post-9-11 DARPA program was close to also seeking a private investor makeover, developed by Douglas Gage, a close friend of Poindexter's and a DARPA program manager, LifeLog, uh, sought to build a database tracking a person's entire existence that included an individual's relationships and communications, their phone calls, mail, their media consumption habits, their purchases, and much more in order to build a digital record of everything an individual says, sees, or does. LifeLog would then take this unstructured data and organize it into discrete episodes or snapshots while also mapping out relationships, memories, events, and experiences. Dude, this is so dystopian. LifeLog, per Gage and supporters of the program, would create a permanent and searchable electronic diary of a person's entire life, which DARPA argued could be used to create next-generation digital assistance and offer users a near-perfect digital memory. Oh, great, folks! You'd never forget a thing ever again! Every time you were humiliated, you could never let that memory go. Gage insisted, even after the program was shut down, that individuals would have had complete control over their own data collection efforts, uh huh, as they could decide when to turn the sensors on or off and decide who will share the data, uh huh. In the years since then, analogous promises of user control have been made by the tech giants of Silicon Valley, only to be broken repeatedly for profit and to feed the government's domestic surveillance apparatus, which we all know of. All right. Um, yeah, it's really brutal. The information that LifeLog gleaned from an individual's every interaction with technology was to be combined with information obtained from a GPS transmitter that tracked and documented the person's location, audiovisual sensors that recorded what the person saw and said, as well as biomedical monitors that gauged the person's health. Like TIA, LifeLog was promoted by DARPA as potentially supporting medical research and the early detection of an emerging epidemic or pandemic. All of this stuff, okay, this is what Whitney gets into. It's really like the deepest of the weeds where people are trying to control thought and control behavior and figure out how do we do that? And maybe it's engineering a pandemic allegedly safe and effective. Critics in mainstream media outlets and elsewhere were quick to point out that the program would inevitably be used to build profiles on dissidents as well as suspected terrorists. Combined with TIA surveillance of individuals at multiple levels, LifeLog went farther by adding physical information like how we feel and media data like what we read to this transactional data. One critic. And how does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? Very, very invaded. That's what it makes me feel. <laughs> very violated is how it makes me feel. It probably it probably stems from your relationship with your mother. It might. Maybe even my father. But Lee Tien of EFF warned at the time that the programs that DARPA was pursuing, including LifeLog, have obvious easy paths to homeland security deployments. Hmm? At the time. DARPA publicly I couldn't have any problem. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. DARPA publicly insisted um, that LifeLog and TIA were not connected, despite their obvious parallels, and that LifeLog would not be used for clandestine surveillance. <laughs> sure. No. However, DARPA's own documentation on LifeLog noted that the project will be able to to infer the user's routines, habits, and relationships with other people, organizations, places, and objects, and to exploit these patterns to ease its task, which acknowledged, which acknowledged its potential to use as a tool of mass surveillance. Yep. Mm -hmm. However, again, despite its proponent's best efforts, LifeLog was shuttered just like TIA. Given what had transpired with TIA, some suspected the program would continue under a different name. For example, Lee Tien of EFF told Vice at the time uh, of LifeLog's cancellation that it would not surprise me to learn the government continued to fund research 
that pushed this area forward without calling it LifeLog. Along with its critics, one of the would-be researchers working on it, MIT's David Carger, was also certain that the DARPA project would continue in a repackaged form. He told Wired that, quote, I'm sure such research will continue to be funded under some other title. I can't imagine DARPA dropping out of such a key research area, unquote. Why is it so key? The answer to these speculations appears to lie within uh, with the company that launched the exact same day that LifeLog was shuttered by the Pentagon. The blue giant, Facebook. Holy shit. Oh, oh, oh. Blue giant. A few months into Facebook's launch <laughs> in June you're, 2004. You're <laughs> Facebook co-founders Mark Zuckerberg and Dustin Moskovitz brought Sean Parker onto Facebook's executive team. We now know that whole story. Parker, previously known for co-founding Napster, later connected Facebook with its first outside investor, Peter Thiel. Now, I don't know how accurate the story of the social network goes, but Parker definitely got them the meeting with Peter Thiel and got them, I think it was a $50,000 investment. As discussed... Hmm. Thiel, at the time, in coordination with the CIA, was actively trying to resurrect at least one controversial DARPA program that had been dismantled the previous year. Notably, John Parker, who became Facebook's first president, had also had a history with the CIA, which sought to recruit him at the age of 16, soon after he'd been busted by the FBI for hacking corporate and military databases. Thanks to Parker... In September 2004, Thiel formally acquired half a million dollars worth of Facebook shares and was added to its board. It wasn't 50000 it was half a million. And that's when they pushed out Eduardo Saverin, by the way. Parker maintained close ties to Facebook as well as to Thiel, with Parker being hired as managing partner of Thiel's Founders Fund in 2006. Thiel left the Facebook board, which he had joined in 2005, in 2022 to focus on supporting Trump-aligned candidates, including J.D. Vance. Okay, again, Peter Thiel <laughs> leaves, leaves Facebook board to back candidates like Vance, who's now the VP under Trump, or at least VP nominee. Yay. Yay. Further incestuousness, Thiel and Facebook co-founder Dustin Moskovitz became involved outside of their social network long after Facebook's rise to prominence, with Thiel's founder fund becoming a significant investor in Moskovitz's company, Asana, in 2012. Thiel's long-standing symbiotic relationship with Facebook co-founders extends to his company, Palantir, as the data that Facebook users make public invariably winds up in Palantir's databases and helps drive the surveillance engine that Palantir runs for U.S. police departments, the military, and the intelligence community. Thanks, folks. And we're giving this all for free. <laughs> Facebook data also feeds another teal back company, Clearview AI. Notably, even LifeLog's architect, Douglas Gage, has publicly commented on Facebook's similarities to the program he had once hoped to lead. In 2015, he told Vice that Facebook is the real face of the pseudo life log at this point. He tellingly added, we've ended up providing the same kind of detailed personal information to advertisers and data brokers. And without arousing the kind of opposition that life log provoked precisely because it is now a private company and not a project housed at DARPA. Captain James T. Kirk pseudo life log. <laughs> I like it. Why do they always name this shit the worst? Like, why, why, why do they do that? Because this is what she does. Like, I'm not. St I'm sure. Like, thank you, thank you, Sarah. Oh. Max Azarello does not seem too far off now. Well, you, except he never references Whitney once in his entire research and his entire volumes of everything, and that screams red flag at me mm -hmm. all right i i don't disagree with his premise yes jimmy's family was a cop his father his brother his whole family was full of cops if i remember correctly uh monarch i yep 
Welcome, welcome to people's families. You can't choose them. Palantir you know? and their surveillance agenda under Trump. So, continuing Whitney Webb's article about J.D. Vance and why this is important. During the Trump administration, Palantir enjoyed an even more privileged status than it had under previous administrations, with Palantir gaining many new lucrative contracts, mainly with the military and intelligence, during Trump's first term. This was likely influenced by Thiel's presence on Trump's transition teams and the close role of Thiel associates in choosing key Pentagon appointees. Huh. And we mm -hmm. covered that earlier. Not only that, but the broader agenda behind Palantir, the decades-long effort to create a pre-crime AI-powered surveillance system in the United States, also got significant boosts during Trump's first term. Remember, Trump loves funding cops. Yep. For instance, Trump's attorney, Attorney General William Barr, quietly legalized pre-crime in the United States under the guise of detecting potential mass shooters before they commit any crime. The program and that's, that's going so well. They're always on people's radars. Absolutely. Bro, they're always. Especially if they're in water towers or on rooftops. The, the, program, uh -huh. the program called DEEP enables the DOJ and FBI to work with private sector partners to surveil people of interest that have committed no crime but are mobilizing towards violence. That's so dystopian again. At roughly the same time the program was announced, Barr was also pushing heavily for a government backdoor into consumer apps and devices, particularly those that utilize encryption. He also signed a data access agreement with UK then Home Secretary Priti Patel, she can fuck off too, that allowed, yep. both, country, that allowed both countries to demand electronic data on consumers from tech companies based in the other country without legal restrictions. Fascism was long since here, folks. Also during the Trump administration, also during the Trump administration, an Israeli intelligence-linked company called Carbine 911 began to be installed throughout the United States in emergency call centers and has since spread throughout the nation. Carbine 911 was heavily funded by Peter Thiel's Founders Fund. Remember that... Sean Parker was the first president of Founders Fund, and Trey Stevens sits on the advisory board alongside Michael Chertoff, who was the head of Homeland Security under George W. Bush, Kirsten Nelson, who was the head of DHS under Trump. Carbine was also heavily funded by Jeffrey Epstein and Leslie Wexner, and for much of its early history was closely associated with former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, Himself an intimate associate of Epstein, to put it lightly. Yay. Yay. The incestuous just doesn't I mean, stop. I mean, it's it's crazy. Um, yep. Carbine 911 and similar companies extract any and all data from consumer smartphones for merely making emergency calls and then use it to analyze the past and present behavior of their callers, react accordingly, and in time predict future patterns with the ultimate goal of uh -huh. smart devices such as smart street lamps making emergency calls to the authorities as opposed to human beings because they get so good at detecting crime or knowing when crime is about to happen ma'am we're gonna have to ask you to calm down before we have to arrest you oh my god like Data obtained from these software products, which are slated to be adopted nationwide as part of a new national next generation 911 system, are of course shared uh -huh. with the same law enforcement agencies now implementing the bar designed National Disruption and Early Engagement Program to target individuals flagged as potentially violent based on vague criteria. Like, for example, if you indicate that you have an affinity for guillotines, maybe. Inflatable ones. Inflatable. Inflatable. In, games, in video games. Combined inflatable with Inflatable ones. That's right. Combined with, balloons. with the domestic <laughs> terror framework released during the Biden administration and the definition of domestic terrorists now encompassing those who oppose U.S. government overreach and those who oppose any form of capitalism, like the Atlanta Forest Defenders, 
also including the World Economic Forum favored stakeholder capitalism and or corporate globalization. Nothing to worry about here, folks. Only approved protesting is allowed. The Trump administration during the same period also mulled the creation of a new health-focused agency modeled after DARPA, the proposed HARPA, which was promoted extensively to Trump by his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, and his daughter, Ivanka, as well as Trump's close friend and former NBC Universal president, Bob Wright. I think he died recently. Um, no, that was Bob hmm. Welch. Or uh, 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 Jack Welch, not Bob Wright. Bob Wright's still alive. Harpa's proposed flagship program, Safe Home, which is stopping aberrant fatal events by helping overcome mental extremes. Uh huh. Would use uh -huh. breakthrough technologies with specificity and sensitivity for early diagnosis of neuropsychiatric violence. Will they, will they be testing Trump on this shit? Specifically, advanced analytical tools based on artificial intelligence and machine learning, because we know that they're so good at this stuff. Oh, my God. The program would have cost, cost an estimated $60 million over four years and would use data from Americans' social media accounts, as well as Apple Watches, which I have on my wrist right now, Fitbits, mm. Amazon Echoes, and Google Homes, which I will not allow in my house, by the way. Silly, but I won't allow those stupid devices. And also other consumer electronic devices. Of course, my phone is also a listening all the time, but that's just silly. Yep. The program would also collect information provided by healthcare providers to identify who may be a threat. Wait, what? How could somebody potentially be a threat well, that would be the COVID angle, I'm guessing. Though HARPA was not created under the Trump administration, Trump reportedly reacted very positively to the proposal and was sold on the concept. Well, he gets sold on a lot of stuff, and then he gets unsold on a lot of stuff, too. I don't know what that really is significant, but if Whitney's saying so, it means something. In addition, before the proposal was known widely... Trump had called on big tech and specifically social media to collaborate with the Justice Department to create software that stops mass murders before they happen by detecting potential mass shooters before they can act. I don't know how they plan to do that. Other than telling the FBI not to, not to stoke their violent criminals. But, however, allegedly, Trump ultimately passed on creating HARPA, which was ultimately created during the Biden administration as ARPA-H underscoring the bipartisan nature of this agenda. Because you know what, what the word bipartisan means, right? Yep. It is a, I think Carlin had some words about that. Yes. I believe that he did. Um, all right. So we're, we're getting through. Are Peter Thiel-backed intelligence contractors MAGA? That's weird. Despite many Thiel-backed or Thiel-founded companies describing themselves as America first and defenders of Western values, a closer examination of these companies suggests this is not the case. One lesser known example is, is Palantir's early role in developing a way for the U.S. government to target Julian Assange, leaks-based journalism in the public interest, and what it called the WikiLeaks threat. In looking at other Teal-linked firms, it's quite clear that at least some of some are more than willing to target Americans on either side of the political divide on behalf of their biggest client, the so-called deep state that Trump supporters revile. Take, for example, the Teal-backed Clearview AI, which claims to now be able to identify every person in the world using its advanced facial recognition system. As Unlimited mm -hmm. Hangout contributor Stavrula Pabst noted in a recent report, follow her on Substack, when asked, her before. when asked in, in an NBC interview about Clearview AI's possible negative ramifications for society, the company's CEO, Hoan Tone Thot, said, that's not a, that's not a thought, thought and hot, whatever, no, um, said, quote, a lot of people's minds on facial recognition technology were changed around January 6th 
when the Ugh. insurrection happened at the U.S. Capitol building, it was very instrumental in being able to make identifications quickly. But wait, if Peter Thiel is MAGA, and MAGA went after the Capitol, huh. As its own CEO stated, Clearview AI was used extensively on J6 and later boasted of its potential for identifying potential rioters at the J6 attack on the Capitol, unquote. In a 2023 interview, a New York Times reporter, Kashmir Hill, added that not only was Clearview AI used at the Capitol that day, but also in the days and weeks that followed to identify alleged rioters. No, no. After the events of J6, Clearview AI reported a 26% uptake of its services from law enforcement, having used its role in targeting Trump supporters as a sales pitch. How long is this? Two and a half minutes. May 2019, Las Vegas, Nevada. A web services Hello, provider Vegas. alerted authorities after a user received images depicting the sexual abuse of a young girl. The only clue was an you know adult what? face visible in one image. I'm not going to show this because I don't know if I can actually show this. And we're in trouble right yep. now. Clearview AI is not the only teal link company willing to target space, to target Trump space, as Palantir's co-founder and current CEO Alex Karp is obsessed with his longtime fear that the far right is going to murder him for his ethnic background. That fear per Karp propels a lot of the decisions made at Palantir. I still can't believe I haven't been shot and pushed out the window, he told the New York Times uh, in 2020. <laughs> the, the author added that if the far right came to power, Karp said he would certainly be among its victims. Who's the first person that's going to get hung? You make a list and I'll show you who they get first. It's me. There's not a box I don't check. He's super paranoid. Then in 2023, Karp stated during an interview at the World Economic Forum annual meeting that we built a we built PG or proprietary software, which single handedly stopped the rise of the far right in Europe. Given that the labels of far right as well as far left are often misused to describe those on either side of the political spectrum that do not subscribe to or support official narratives, it's worth asking if far right Karp claims to have stopped referred to people to, who actually deserve the label or right-leaning populism given populism of any flavor is a threat to Palantir's benefactors in the corporate world and in the U.S. national security community. Just expand what's a threat. Everybody's a threat. That's, that's Alex Karp at 2016 Bilderberg, apparently. In addition, Trump supporters that did not subscribe to official narratives around and who's COVID. that behind him? Who was that behind him? Chives, the butler. Of course. He was Downton Abbey. Of course, sir. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Excuse right. me, sir. You've dropped your dignity. In addition, Trump supporters did, that did not subscribe to official narratives around COVID policies should be aware of Palantir's role in the Trump administration's COVID response and also in the COVID vaccination rollout. During COVID, Palantir developed Tiberius which was used by Health and Human Services to help the federal government allocate the amount of vaccine each state would receive and also to decide where every allocated dose would go from local doctor's offices to large medical centers. Why? Tiberius and by extension Palantir collected all the COVID-19 and healthcare data from U.S. government agencies, local and state governments, pharmaceutical firms, vaccine manufacturers, and companies contracted to act as vaccine distributors. They then sat at the middle of all of this. Palantir was also provided Americans sensitive health information by the Trump era HHS, as well as a wide range of demographic, employment, and public health data sets in order to help identify high priority populations to receive the vaccine first. This couldn't have had anything to do with voting and where to restrict certain things or ah, nothing, no way. Just totally do with help. But remember, during COVID, Palantir was also a member of the COVID-19 Health Coalition, whose other members included 
in Qtel, which was Palantir's first funder, as well as Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, companies that all managed to somehow stay open. Huh, how about that? Yep. Palantir also managed the HHS Tech Database, a secretive database that hoarded and still hoards information related to the spread of COVID-19 gathered from, quote, more than 225 data sets, including demographic statistics, community-based tests, and a wide range of state-provided data. At the time, HHS Protect was criticized by several public health experts and epidemiologists, among others, because of the sudden decision by the Trump-era HHS to force hospitals to provide all data on COVID cases and patient information directly to HHS, HHS Protect, and thus to Palantir. Doesn't that violate HIPAA? Hospitals, hospitals were threatened with the loss of Medicare or Medicaid funding if they declined to regularly feed all of their COVID-19 patient data and test results into the HHS Protect database. I wonder if Pfizer was paying to be involved in that database. What do you think? Palantir declined to provide any information on any of the safeguards it had in place to protect Americans' health data in any of its HHS-related programs, despite requests to do so from senators and congresspeople. That's a problem, but they're above the law. They am above the law. HHS Protect also later incorporated HHS Vision, which is an AI-driven predictive component, you know, these assholes love their predictive analysis. Which uses pre-written algorithms to simulate behaviors and forecast possible outcomes. Like tabletop exercises that could potentially game out whether a laptop was real or not, or how companies would react to it. But this is applied to a health scenario. Aspects of HHS Protect share remarkable similarities with the scrapped Total Information Awareness subprogram known as biosurveillance. So basically, what would happen uh, in a pandemic? But this is given the data that's on everybody's person with their their devices and even their clothing. You would be able to assess everything about them, what they're saying, and what they in what their intentions are and what their plans might be. It's really fucked up. Uh, night, night, Sarah. I know this is a long one. Um, not only that, but a longtime consultant of Palantir, Avril Haines, and we know her very well, was a key fixture at the controversial pandemic simulation in late 2019 that was tied to previous intelligence-linked biosecurity events like the 2001 anthrax, anthrax attacks. Now, Avril Haines, who is she? She's a former CIA deputy director who worked very closely with her superior, John Brennan, at CIA, including during the times that Brennan illegally surveilled Trump associates during the 2016 election cycle, and then helped propagate and develop the Russiagate narrative, which Haynes is now conveniently resurrecting. Haynes, shortly after participating in Event 201, joined the Biden administration and has been serving as the administration's top intelligence official, the DNI, since Biden took office in January 2021. So Palantir has literally had somebody sitting right there next to the president the entire time. Palantir is also controversial among the American left for its role in using big data to facilitate ICE raids on migrants and its decision to pilot its pro predictive policing, i.e. pre-crime functionality, in low-income minority communities. My guess is they're going to start using drones for that sooner rather than later, both the dog ones and flying ones. Um, ultimately, Palantir, like many other military intelligence contractors with close ties to Peter Thiel, is a tool of the national security state, which has been ramping up its war on domestic terror apparatus that per government documentation and per Whitney's been warning us for four years will target dissent on both left and right and essentially 
anyone who attempts to stand or even speak against government overreach and criminality. This scares the shit out of me here as an independent dissident, uh, whatever we are here, podcaster, reporter, journalist, anything. This is us with Teal, Palantir, and Joe Lonsdale now pumping millions into the Trump Vance campaign after the recent VP announcement, it seems almost inevitable that Palantir and the other linked military contractors will have even more influence in a second Trump administration than it did during his first term. On top of setting it up that if Vance is going to be the successor, possibly, then you've got to deal with direct links to the President of the United States. I know, Reese exhausted. I don't even know if he's going to want to do boats after this. No, I, we'll get through that. we right. got an intermission. All right, well, we'll have an intermission, mm. but before that, if That's you appreciate... It's exhausting. It's just like... Whitney, you put You put so much in here, Whitney. How does anyone digest all of it? Well, like... Rain Man here. Has, oh, my brain, my brain, my yes, brain is most hurting. Most people's brains are hurting, I get. Um, so before we get to Blaine Breach, brain bleach with Reef and Boats, first of all, amazingly, these, these wonderful folks have hooked us up and tipped our channel. Yes, we are going to get to Boats, but um, so, yep, if you can support us, we really could use the help. Support independent media, we need it more than ever. We work on a value for value system, as Steve Poikinen at AM Wake Up likes to say, and we like to clown him about it, but it's actually I am once again asking for your financial support. But it's actually a great system. It was developed by Adam Curry and John Dvorak <laughs> of the No Agenda Radio and No Agenda Podcast. And it really means that if you if you are getting value, whether you can donate time, treasure, or talent. All right, I got to do it in oh. Steve's voice and give him give him the credit because he came up with it. All right, but any one of those three, we can certainly use all of them. Because